Good evening. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, and we just let folks in on this uh, live stream. We're also live on uh, Facebook. And uh, we're just letting our attendees, we've got a lot of folks here to present. I always wondered why Zoom takes a while to filter in all the attendees as the event starts and goes live. We're gonna just wait a couple of moments for more people to find their way in. Good evening. Well, I see we are joined by our uh, New York City public advocate. Uh, Jamani, do you have a time constraint or would you like to a little, wait a little longer for more folks to hop on? Uh, there is a time constraint, but it includes waiting a little while longer for folks to hop on. Fair enough. Peace and blessings, everybody. Good to see you. I'm slightly envious that I had to wear a uh, button down today. <laughs> As, as we as we emerge from this pandemic, wearing pants that close with belt loops is going to be the challenge many of us are facing. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I think this is our sixth or seventh annual Tenants' Rights uh, Town Hall. I want to thank everyone who's uh, joined us today. Um, Council Member Ben Kalos, I represent uh, the Upper East Side, East Midtown, Roosevelt Island, and East Harlem, and uh, I, I would like to, what we're gonna hear about today is how evictions are going to work during this pandemic and what sorts of protections there are, what your rights are as a tenant, exemptions from rent increases for seniors and the disabled, how you can fight rent increases on stabilized apartments and uh, how we can win another rent freeze. We'll also be taking your question to get answered by attorneys. Uh, your rights as tenants in New York City have been under stress for some time, so tonight we're here to help you feel more confident about them and to educate you on what they are. I want to take a moment to thank all the organizations presenting tonight and for the work you do every day to help tenants. We have the Homes Isaacs Coalitions, Tenants and Neighbors, Take Root Justice, Met Council, uh, NILAG, Legal Aid, and Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. Uh, I also want to thank our uh, elected officials who are with us tonight. Uh, we will be joined by, we are joined by our public advocate, Jamani Williams, who will be joined by Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright. And we may have a surprise drop in from our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Uh, this event was also co sponsored by Congresswoman Carol Maloney, State Senator Liz Kruger, Assemblymember Dan Court, and Councilmember Keith Powers. I'd like to now take a moment to introduce uh, Jamani Williams, uh, who is our New York City public advocate. He's also here with our deputy public advocate, Delsenia Glover. Uh, both of them got their starts as tenant organizers. And uh, Jamani Williams is somebody that I look up to incredibly because he is the first elected official in New York City history to win citywide office while refusing real estate money. Uh, and I wish other people running for citywide would do the same thing, uh, but it's, it seems to have been just a, a one-off, but that means that as housing and buildings chair, he's been able to really, when he was in the council, really stand up uh, for tenants, for our workers. We've passed a huge slate of laws together, the uh, stand for tenant safety, protecting tenants from construction as harassment, uh, legislation protects construction workers on the job site, and of course, we were able to fight for and win multiple rent freezes. Please join me in welcoming public advocate, Jamani Williams. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Peace and blessings, love and light to everybody. Uh, and I was able to, uh, I guess, make that feat, which you, you always point out, I appreciate um, because of the work you did uh, and making sure that uh, we had better funded uh, public elections. And so was, that was helpful. Hopefully at some point we'll get fully funded uh, public election. Uh, but first, I just want to say, you know, thank you, Ben, for this uh, and for all the work that you do. And I just want to remind folks, you know, sometimes uh, there are certain, uh, just all around the city, all in the state, the elected officials that do certain things 
around uh, certain election times. Uh, but Ben is not one of them. He's been working on these issues for a very long time. <laughs> As I said, he's been doing uh, this one annually for, uh, for years. And so this is not something just doing now, but things he's been dedicated on. And I can assure you uh, that when he's not doing Zooms and he's not in front of the camera, he's pressing for and doing the same things uh, on the floor of the council and in the rooms where nobody is there. So I just want to uh, say thank you to Ben uh, for that and the work we're able to do together uh, in the city council. Um, it is uh, great to see uh, the community come out in force, uh, even in Zoom, uh, but uh, I know we may be Zoomed out. So, so hopefully soon we'll be able to come back together. Um, but we have learned that people have really lied about why they were late so many times because people have been late to Zoom. So that's a, that's a, whole, a whole other conversation. Uh, but you've heard it many times uh, that you can count, uh, but it always bears repeating. Uh, we've been living in unprecedented times over the past year, uh, and hopefully we're coming out of the other side stronger, more determined than we ever have been around housing justice in New York City and New York State. I keep saying that we can't go back to normal. If we go back to normal, we would have failed miserably because normal didn't work for the vast majority of people. Uh, however, there's some very real serious concerns uh, that are like a cloud threatening on the horizon. Uh, there are some real and very serious issues uh, that we have to continue to talk about. The potential eviction and the homelessness that follows uh, shouldn't be made light of. Uh, if we don't remain strong and vigilant about protecting our city for folks uh, like you in the room and many folks that you and I know uh, who make it what it is, we're gonna see problems. And the response to homelessness and other issues for far too long hasn't been to provide home and supportive housing, it's been uh, to send law enforcement. That only gets worse if homelessness increases. And I wanna make clear, um, there are uh, particularly small homeowners, and, you know, I, you know, as a public figure, I wanna make sure I'm always clear on that, that need assistance as well. We don't want folks to get foreclosed on, uh, but it is right to set up space to discuss the plight of tenants. Um, and that's what we're doing here today. There are many organizations in the room who will be speaking shortly, uh, including uh, some many that I've worked with even before I was in the city council. I can't shout out everybody, but I do gotta shout out tenants and neighbors uh, because I was the executive director there before I was a council member. So they always have a, obviously a warm place in my heart. There are other advocacy groups who are gonna speak about activism, rent laws and tenant protections. Uh, the most important thing that I think folks should know right now and information that you would share that are gonna be shared with all your neighbors and community members, many of whom are in precarious situations after job and income losses, is how to protect themselves against eviction. Uh, it's been a shock, as well as a scary piece of knowledge that New Yorkers collectively owe more than $1 billion, with a B, in back rent. Uh, the folks from Legal Aid will talk about that, uh, but I wanna urge you as a community, spend the next three months of the eviction moratorium, urging folks in the community who are behind to apply for the COVID rent relief. It's one thing to have it. It's another thing to make sure that people who sometimes don't have access to this information or the uh, the uh, the things that are needed, the software the, to, to actually apply for it, uh, apply for it. So amplifying this information is the best thing we can do for neighbors right now. According to a study by ADH, NHD last uh, this past March, 40,000 residential tenants have been taken to court for eviction proceedings since last March of 2020. That's 40,000. That's during what's supposed to be a moratorium with an average claim of 8,150. Nationally, Black and Latinx households only have an average savings of $1,500. They found further that landlords are, evict are filing evictions almost four times faster than zip codes with the highest rates of death from COVID-19. Residents of the zip codes hit the hardest 68.2% uh, people of more color compared to 30% in the neighborhoods who have hit the least. If there's anything positive that comes out of this pandemic, it is the inequities in our society have been shown in high color. <laughs> and once you see something, you have to say something. I am worried that the further away we go from this, we'll have collective amnesia. So we have to use what we have right now. Lastly, I have signed up for the Rental Guidelines Board public hearing. Not sure if I'll be talking on the 15th or 17th, uh, but I'll be there to tell uh, the board uh, what tenants need uh, and why uh, they need the relief that we're gonna ask for across the city. I wanna encourage all rent regulated tenants, organizations, elected officials to sign up, testify. Our voices are nerd, uh, needed. Uh, tenants need our support. We can't have mass evictions uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I know this is gonna be an awesome time 
where we're going to learn a lot. And Ben, you already did, but shout out to uh, my deputy public advocate, Delcinia Glover. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Uh, love and light to everyone. Thank you. We've got about 50 attendees on the Zoom, 20 over Facebook. And I know folks will be coming in. We had over 100 RSVPs. I'll be joining the public advocate at the uh, annual rent guidelines board hearings. That's you're going to learn more about it tonight. Uh, and uh, our next uh, two speakers are really kind of the stars of the show, because uh, in order to be a tenant organizer like Jamani and Delcinia were, you, you need somebody to organize. And even elected officials, we can only do things when we have the community uh, behind us and working with us. And uh, every one of our speakers tonight is going to talk to you about how the most important person on this Zoom, uh, on this feed, is you. And so we have two tenant leaders who have actually taken the lessons learned. I remember my first time meeting with them, their first time meeting with an elected official. Uh, I remember uh, being in meetings with them uh, and NYCHA as we were working through our first agendas together. And uh, now they are leaders in their own right. Uh, and folks are looking to them for leadership uh, all over the borough of Manhattan. Uh, so if you can please join me in welcoming uh, Sandrea Coleman and Lakeisha Taylor, the co-founders of the Holmes Isaacs Coalition, who together with some a little help from their friends on this call and this Zoom uh, beat NYCHA infill when Mayor de Blasio and NYCHA said it couldn't be done. Okay, so we agreed that I'll set it off and she'll close us down. Um, so uh, greetings all, um, thank you for this uh, council member Ben Kalos, we really appreciate this opportunity. Um, greetings all, I am Sandra I. Coleman, I'm one of the co-founders of the Holmes Isaacs Coalition and a co-founder and co-host of the One Night Your Podcast. As a longtime activist and organizer, I am grateful to have and still organize residents at Holmes Towers, Isaac Houses and beyond. Others and myself begin organizing residents at Holmes Towers and Isaac Houses mid-2015 when the infill proposal uh, was slated for Holmes Towers. We had the support of Council Member Ben Kalos, Congresswoman Carol Maloney, Assembly Member Robert Rodriguez, uh, Gail Brewer, and so many other elected officials stood and supported us. Organizing residents is not an easy task. They need the facts as well as must be informed of any pros and cons when something is directly impacting them. We had numerous press conferences advocating for funding, a party to save our playground, as well as two huge mat, uh, marches to Gracie Mansion. Um, years went by and residents were left feeling depleted. Jose, Lakeisha and I formed the Homes Isis Coalition in mid 2019 to officially keep our direct residents and others throughout the city aware of their rights and educate them on how to fight for repairs. On Friday, December 13th of 2019, several residents of Home Towers and Isaac's Houses sued NYCHA for the deplorable conditions we live in. We were and still are represented by Take Root Justice in this HP action lawsuit. From toxic mold infestation in our inoperable elevators, uh, no heat, no hot water, or too much heat, to name a few. At the end of the day, our main ask has and always has been for the city, state, and federal government to adequately fund all NYCHA properties. We do not need the funding over 10 year, a 10-year span. We need billions of dollars flushed into NYCHA right now. Um, sadly, with HUD providing $30 million uh, to NYCHA weekly, we do not know where this funding is going. Uh, we also, uh, NYCHA was declared a state of emergency a few years ago by Governor Cuomo, and a federal monitor has been installed. Uh, and we seem to be, uh, but the only thing they seem to be offering us is the privatization schemes uh, to preserve our homes, such as RADPAC, the blueprint and infill, which we resist and demand that public housing remain public. Uh, lastly, I was part of the public uh, advocates worst landlord list of 2020, which showed my horrific bathroom conditions that remain unfixed due to the pandemic. NYCHA has systemic policies that hinders residents that organize and we are not welcomed even as we wanna 
a feed the community, you know, we always have pushbacks. Take it away, Lakeisha. And I'll close in there. Thank you, Sandrea. Thank you, Councilman, for allowing us to speak. As Sandrea has adequately stated, nothing but pushback and organizing is not an easy task. To organize within itself, we have to fight against people who are marginalized. And just to produce this HP action, we had to go through our own um, development and basically give people the courage to stand up. And people who live in NYCHA are, let's say, I like to say that they are abused because to live in these conditions, you are told you are less than, you are showed you are less than, and we have to empower them. And we, we have to let them know that you have the same exact rights as people who live on Madison Avenue, who live on Fifth Avenue, who live in Chelsea. And so to be an organizer, you have to empower, you have to lift up, and you have to show them the right to fight. And we, we showed that. And like you said, we won. And that's why we, we don't only fight for this development, but we fight throughout the city and we empower everyone. And this is something that we, we want to do and we want to show everyone. And sadly, NYCHA is, as Sandra has said, on the worst list and this continues to happen. I was late to this call because I had someone who showed up at my door stating that they need this help. And it is so important that we have people like you standing behind us. And this is what we want to show everyone. And we thank you. Um, and we have to continue to fight. Thank you. Just wanna share one quick organizing tip. Your elected officials work for you. And in the first meeting I had with Sandrea and Lakeisha, they said, give us your mobile number, you work for us. Uh, they were much more polite about it than that, but they've had it and they reach out anytime things aren't going well. And uh, I work for them. That's how it should work. We will now, and, and so you, you've heard from two of our tenant leaders here in the neighborhood and what can be done when you activate, when you organize. Uh, I'd like to now turn it over to Abby and from Tenants and Neighbors group that works to help organize tenants to preserve at-risk affordable housing, strengthen tenants' rights in the state of New York. Uh, Abby will be speaking on updates on advocacy and renters' bills during the pandemic and remote organizing. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, council member, for inviting tenants and neighbors to speak. Um, and I'm so happy that I get to follow Sandrea and Lakeisha, who are great examples of uh, tenant leaders. Um, so today I will be speaking on uh, tenant advocacy, giving some updates on uh, bills and legislation that we're working on moving together. Um, and then I'll let you know how to get involved in the housing movement. Um, so when we work together, you know, we can, we can win. Tenant power is immense um, and we've seen it work before. Um, you can go to the next slide. Awesome, thank you. Um, so in 2019, um, we won historic rent laws, um, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act. Um, and you've probably heard of it, but just in case you haven't, um, it, makes, it makes rent stabilization laws permanent. It strengthened tenant protect protections it closed loopholes that allowed for rent increases and destabilization. Um, and it was, yeah, it, we worked, we fought hard, we organized, we rallied, and that couldn't have happened without um, tenant leaders. Um, we also won rent freezes in 2020. Um, you know, we testified at rent guidelines board hearings and Take Root Justice will speak more on this about how we can continue that fight. Um, we also won an eviction moratorium. Um, it, it has been extended through August 31st, um, and you can fill out a hardship declaration to protect yourself from eviction. Um, and legal aid will speak more on this later. Um, and very importantly, we also won a rent relief, which we fought really hard for. Um, and we really owe it to all the tenants um, who turned out and who 
you know, contacted their representatives and turned out at rallies. Um, and uh, there are two important things about the program that we won. Um, undocumented tenants are eligible for this program and self-attestation is allowed, which means that uh, you can easily provide, if you can't easily provide official documentation to prove you've lost income, you can sign a form that will be accepted as proof. And so that will hopefully make um, the process easier for people. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, those are huge victories. Um, we fought really hard and we're really grateful for the progress, but the work is not done. Uh, we must keep fighting for safe and affordable housing. No one should have to choose between rent and food or paying bills. Um, no one should feel like they're living in unsafe, unstable living conditions. Um, and so as part of several coalitions, Tenants and Neighbors is, um, working on a couple pieces of legislation that will hopefully create um, sustainable solutions to the, the power imbalance that exists uh, between tenants and landlords. Um, and so as part of the Housing Justice for All Coalition, we're pushing a, a couple things on the statewide level. The first is a uh, good cause eviction. Um, and that basically will protect tenants not covered by rent regulations um, and prevents evictions for the sole purpose of harassment or rent increase, uh, basically the right to a renewal lease. Um, and this will hopefully you know, establish tenant stability, uh, help curb displacement and gentrification by limiting speculation. Um, we're also uh, fighting for the Housing Access Voucher Program, which will create an rent a rental assistance program similar to Section 8, um, for New Yorkers who are currently homeless or who are at risk of homelessness. Um, and this would include undocumented New Yorkers. Um, a lot of acronyms here, but we are also fighting for the Housing Our Neighbors with Dignity Act, HONDA. Um, and this is uh, a unique opportunity to convert uh, hotels um, into housing for those struggling with homelessness. Um, and lastly, on the statewide level, we're also advocating for the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. Um, so when tenants, this would basically allow tenants the right to first refusal and to first offer um, when uh, an owner considers selling their building. Um, and this hopefully would uh, contribute to eliminating the, the landlord power dynamic that exists um, and allows landlords to be predatory and intimidating and threatening. Um, and also guarantee long-term affordability. Um, on the national level, uh, Tenants and Neighbors is a part of, of the National Alliance of HUD Tenants. Um, so that's you know project-based Section 8 tenants, Section 8 tenants. Um, and the, uh, the Tenant Empowerment Act would help uh, enforce housing standards and strengthen tenants' rights. Um, on, as part of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, um, we're working to increase rental assistance, um, like housing choice vouchers, um, create more affordable housing and strengthen tenant protections. So that was a lot of information um, and a lot that we're working on right now. Um, but it all, uh, what we're working towards is um, a future where Tenants aren't, aren't, don't, don't feel unsafe or unstable and everyone deserves um, a right to a home that feels safe um, and affordable. So we can go to the next slide and I will let you know how you can get involved. Um, so if you're here, um, I'm sure you're already familiar with uh, this, this first one, contact representatives, um, stay in touch with them, um, you know, call, email, let them know what's happening in your building, what's happening in your neighborhood. Um, uh, they, a lot of them want to know, and if they don't, you can tell them anyway and make your voice heard. Um, you can also show up and bring your neighbors to direct actions. Um, as part of Housing Justice for All, we've done a lot of different actions. Um, we've shown up at Carl Hasty's office. Um, we've marched across the Brooklyn bridge and the Manhattan bridge. Um, and um, they can be really powerful ways to um, show support for some of the legislation that I previously listed. 
Um, and this one, this third bullet point here is a really important one. Uh, organize your building. Um, this is where it all starts. This is, um, you know, if, you, if you're having issues in your apartment, most likely your neighbor is also having issues. Uh, and you can come together to hold your landlord accountable and then take it a step further. Think about the big picture and help advocate for um, policy that creates long-term solutions. Um, and lastly, I'll close out just by saying um, at Tenants and Neighbors, we're involved in a lot of advocacy work and we want to help you get involved. So please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my phone number is there and my email is there and we're happy to um, connect you to the housing movement and offer any support that you need to organize your building. Um, and that's it, so I'll pass it to the uh, next presenter. Thanks everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all the great work that you do. Uh, quite a legacy between Delcenia and the public advocate. Uh, I'd like to now uh, welcome Andrew Shapiro from Met Council. Met Council is focused on fighting poverty, serving immigrants, seniors, living on fixed incomes, and on and underemployed and anyone else in need. Uh, Met Council's of um, and uh, Andrew will be presenting on breaking leases and the New York State's new federally funded emergency rental assistance program. Please join me in welcoming Andrea. Thank you so much. And thank you, Abby, for that great setup on all the things we've won this year and we're continuing to fight for. Um, again, my name is Andrew Shapiro. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Programs at the Met Council on Housing, New York's oldest citywide tenants union. Um, and so as of Tuesday, New York State now has something called the New York State Emergency Rent Rental Assistance Program, or ERAP for short. The portal opened Tuesday at 9 a.m. Um, and is starting to accept applications for people who are behind in rent. The program will cover up to 12 months of back rent, as well as three months of rent going forward. Um, for folks who are considered rent burdened or pay more than 30% of their income in rent. And it will cover rent dual arrears going back to March 13th of 2020. The rental arrears will be paid directly to your landlord or property manager. Um, and just so you all know, I know not everyone has the best landlord. And in past rental assistance programs, some landlords have refused the money. Here, if they refuse the money, it will be put on hold. Um, you're given an eviction moratorium once you apply um, and the courts will hold on to the money. It's considered a defense in housing court as well as after six months, if they refuse to take the money, your debt is canceled by the state. So there's a lot of protections that are given as well as if, you, if your landlord takes the money, you have a year's rent freeze, as well as a year of what we call good cause protection, which means you're, if you're in an unregulated apartment, your landlord can't just decide not to renew your lease once they've taken the money. So the people who are eligible for the program are people who live at 80% or below of area median income. Um, so for an individual, um, that's around 66,000. For um, a household of two, it's 76,000 approximately. Um, so it really covers a lot of people. Um, you'll have to prove that you either lost income or had increased expenses during the COVID time period um, and that you owe rent and you owe rent in your current apartment. Um, and it's really important that if you think that you're eligible that you apply for the program. The program gives a lot of protections just for applying. And there's no reason why we should leave this money on the table that Chuck Schumer and Kristen Gillibrand fought so hard for, um, as well as all of our federal representatives. The application it can be done online or with various community providers, including Catholic um, charities in Manhattan. It's a relatively simple application, though I know not everyone has access to the internet or is comfortable. There's lots of people who can help. So it's really important that if you're having problems, please reach out. 
the application has been having problems with some people applied. And so if you try to apply on Monday, I'm sorry, on Tuesday or Wednesday and the application was down, please continue and please let us know. It's really important that we make sure the state is held accountable for this program. We've seen really bad programs in the past um, and we need to make sure that they're actually giving out this money to tenants and they're not just sitting on it. So in order to apply, you'll need personal identification, so an ID card of some sort, proof of the rent you pay, proof of residency, and proof of income. And they, they accept a whole, group, a whole lot of different types of paperwork for this, so be creative. If you don't have a lease, how else can you show that you paid rent? You don't have a driver's license, what other ID cards do you have? Um, and as Abby mentioned, you were able to win self-attestation for almost all of these. And so if you really don't have any of these documentations, you're able to say in a sworn document that you're telling the truth, which is really important. A lot of states don't have this. And so it's sort of unique for New York and something that tenants were able to win um, from this program. It's not part of the, necessarily the federal rule, which is really exciting and something we are able to do by pushing our state representatives. There's still a lot of questions about what is a household when it comes to roommates um, and people who are not traditional households. Um, the state wasn't really expecting that many roommates, I guess, but we know that's a big problem in New York, that a lot of people just have roommates, people they live with, their subletters, um, and there's still a lot of questions. And we're here with you to figure this out, and we'll continue advocating on the state to make sure that we are getting everyone who owes back rent covered. Um, and so, Again, it's really important if you think you qualify to apply and that if you are worried about how to apply, you don't know, your, the website's confusing you, please reach out to Ben Kalos's office, one of your other political representative offices, my council's hotline, or Catholic Charities. Um, and the state is not going to pay is having all landlords who take the money waive their fees, but they are asking for you to put in the fee amount. Um, and so landlords have been able to um, have fees for missing rent, back rent. Um, you'll need to add that information to the form, but the state is not actually gonna cover that and landlords are gonna be forced to take off those um, costs from what you owe. And when it comes to, to breaking your lease, we know this is a hard time. And a lot of people wanna get out of an apartment they can't afford. But it's really important that right now, if you want help with back rent, you're gonna to have to be in that apartment. The ERAP program only covers your current residency. And so if you wanna move, make sure you apply for this program and wait to get the money before you leave. You're breaking the lease before you break your lease. And it's hard to break the lease, especially as the market in Manhattan is not great right now. Unfortunately, there's no special rules about breaking because of COVID or because you can't pay the rent. Um, under 2019 laws, your landlord needs to do a good faith effort to try and find someone else for the lease. Um, and we would recommend that you also try and find someone else for the lease. If you have specific questions about how to break your lease, um, please call our hotline, which hopefully um, someone from Kale's office can put in the chat or I can try. Um, our number is 212-979-0611. And we're happy to answer all your calls on how to break your lease on the ERAP program and how to get them more involved in the tenant movement. Thank you. Thank you so much. We now have Pilar from Take Root Justice, which is an organization that provides legal services, participatory research assistance, and policy support to our community-based partners in social justice movements. Pilar will be explaining RGB, how meetings have been cut short, um, give an update from the preliminary vote, and talk about the Rent Justice Coalition. Um, take it away, thank you so much. 
Uh, thank you, Abby, and thank you, Ben, for having me here again. And you know, best of wishes in your upcoming election. Um, yeah, I'm Pilar de Jesus. I am a senior advocacy coordinator at Take Root Justice, and I'm also one of the members of Rent Justice Coalition. And many of the members of the coalition are here. You just heard from Andrea, who's one of the amazing leaders and organizers in our coalition. Um, and so our coalition is a group, Rent Justice Coalition is a group of organizers, tenants, and legal service providers that come together. I mean, these last few years, we've been coming together earlier before the RGB season, um, preparing you know, for what's to come, especially with the pandemic and preparing to organize um, on how we were going to push for the, the board to really um, take into consideration what was, ha you know, tenants have been in hardship for years. Um, pandemic has made it worse for many um, and just honoring that voices of these, the people, the 1 million people that live in rent stabilized housing is heard. And so we have been the, the coalition has, who has been really holding the line um, when it comes to this board and, you know, really, organizing um, around the rent freezes the last few years that you may have noticed, including the one that happened last year during the pandemic um, that was due to organizing and tenants, even during a pandemic, just putting that pressure on the board and local elected officials. Um, oh, sorry, that is terrible. Um, but yeah, so Rent Justice Coalition, we are on Facebook, check us out. Um, follow us, join us. We always need more people to help us, especially with our turnouts. And Ben Kalos has also been one of our, one of our electeds have been very supportive. So thank you, Ben, and thank you for having us here. Um, so yeah, you, you, you've you heard about the Rent Guidelines Board, I'm sure. Um, and you're probably like, who are these people? If you don't know, they're a group of nine, um, nine people, and I believe it's four public, well, five public members, and out of the five, it's including the chair. And you have two representatives that also rep that would represent the landlords and two representatives that represent the tenant's interest. And every year around the beginning of March, they start coming together to just start looking at reports, talking to, to prepare for the season that comes. And again, so this board is one, it's um, mandated to establish the rent adjustments for about the 1 million rent stabilized apartments that are in this city. Um, how they are put, um, appointed to the board is by the mayor. Um, and again, the, this is the board that determines um, what your adjustments for your rent are gonna be. Sorry guys, I should turn my phone off. Um, you know, what your rent adjustments are gonna be for the year. And like I mentioned, the Rent Justice Coalition for the last, I would say like six or seven years or more, or seven years or something like that, we have been really putting that pressure on this board to, um, to, 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 to hear and understand the hardships of the tenants. And so again, this, this board is a board of public members, tenant reps and, la and landlord reps. And you know, over the years, for many, 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 many years, the landlords have been crying broke and they're always broke. And during Bloomberg years, this board, um, you know, has um, provided increases to tenants as high as I believe 8% or a little higher, forgive me if I that number is wrong, but it's just been so long. But they, they, they were really high numbers. And until the coalition, I would say, started really getting involved and in putting that pressure, we are the ones who are responsible, part of that responsible part of getting that rent freeze. And so, yeah, there's, there's nine people, they come together this time and they're the ones who say, hey, you need an increase or not. And so we have been really fighting against, um, you know, an increase for the last few years, the way the data shows, because they're mandated to look at data, it shows that the tenants are actually due a rent decrease but you know we have been lucky enough to just get a rent freeze, um, and so again, it takes a lot of work in organizing to get these members to hear us. And we are also very lucky to have amazing representatives on the tenant side, um, Shayla Garcia and Leah Goodridge, 
who are very strong women who have been really been our voices in the last couple of years and fighting for us, especially the last two years, trying to really advocate the importance that this these meetings are accessible and available for tenants. Prior to the pandemic, we had five meetings, one in each borough except for Staten Island, two in Manhattan. Um, there were translated hearings, you know, um, meetings that were translated, and that was also part of us putting that pressure on them because there was a time where these meetings weren't even translated. There was no language accessibility, and so it's been, um, you know, so we've had five five hearings in the past where tenants come and testify. There are one million rent stabilized tenants. I didn't think then that that was enough, but that was what we had. And unfortunately, during, during COVID, the, the RGB, I'm not sure who in that in the RGB, you know, determined that two was enough, but they and they haven't been hearing the voices of the tenants and the advocates saying two is not enough. And um, they have um, just ignored us and, you know, move forward with just shortening the meetings. And they've done that again this year, even though we've pushed and asked that they honor us. And um, that's not been happening. So we've had our own people's hearing, which we had one last week. And I believe over 100 people came out to testify. And Andrea could probably tell you exactly the number. But we gave that people the opportunity to really talk and send a message to the RGB. Why? One, we need a rent rollback. But unfortunately, um, during this preliminary vote this year, they actually voted in a range where there would be an increase in your second year. So this year they voted for a uh, 0% in the one year. And I can't remember the exact numbers for two year now. They're slipping my mind, but I think it's, it, there isn't a zero the way it was included last year. Last year it was like zero. If you signed a two year lease, there was um, zero for the first year of the two year and then a 1.5, I believe, for the second year. And I think this year they're proposing between a 1.5 or uh, a 1.5 and 2.5 and forgive me, so many numbers. But again, that's just their proposal. They haven't actually complete voted on that. So we but that's the range that they're saying they're going to vote in. And unfortunately, it's not a decrease. So we need you guys to really register to speak. Unfortunately, they had asked people to pre-register. If you go to the rent guidelines board dot city, um, city of New York dot US, you can, uh, and I know not everyone has accessibility, but also you, I know Met Council and others here are, could also help you if you wanna try to testify, even though the testimony pre-registration is closed right now. The hearings are on June 15th between as a Tuesday between 4 and 7 p.m. Um, the next one is June 17th between 5 and 9 p.m. And again, it's really, in my opinion, it's a really disheartening to hear that that they there. These are the only two days and that is the time and I myself can't even register to speak because I didn't pre-register. And so I have to ask for accommodations. And I'm sorry, I know I'm taking a little bit more time. And so I am going to end there. But just in a nutshell, the Rent Guidelines Board are meeting June 15th and June 17th. Tune in. It's on YouTube. Register to speak. Even if there is no space right now, please register. And, you know, even ask for accommodations. Then please tell your story because... Yeah, it's just going to be really important for all the voices of, of the city to be heard, um, you know, so thank you. Sorry, I went off and apologize for the interruptions here. Even though I was trying to turn off my phone, it's not working, sorry. Thank you so, so much for all of that information. We really appreciate it. Um, we now have Caitlin and Randy from NILAG who will be presenting on holdover cases, HP actions, and how to get repairs in your apartment. Uh, thank you, Abby, and thank you, council member, for having us here. Um, I'm gonna share the screen. Um, I don't think I can share it, but, um, so I'll be going over HP proceedings, and HP proceedings are lawsuits. You can share now, Randy. I'm, oh, okay, um, let me try that again. I'm sorry, I don't think I can do it. Um, 
I'll so, share it and just tell me when you want to go to the next slide. Okay. Um, are we on the first slide by any chance? Just one moment. Okay. Um, so while we get that um, set up, um, NYLAG is a nonprofit legal organization and we provide free legal services to New Yorkers. And our unit, the Housing um, Tenants Rights Unit, provides free legal representation to tenants facing um, holdovers and non payments in um, housing court, in addition to immigration services, um, health services, um, and any really any civil legal services that you can think of. Um, but today we're going to focus on HP proceedings, non payment proceedings, and holdover proceedings. Uh, could I have the next slide? Thanks. So uh, an HP proceeding is um, a lawsuit brought by the tenant to obtain repairs in an apartment. So when I use the word tenant, it's um, referring to the uh, person who entered into the lease for the apartment or anyone who's occupying the apartment. So um, before starting this case, I usually recommend that um, the repairs are requested to the landlord in writing. So that can be in text, email, um, letters, and also to call 311 for repairs. Um, I'm sorry, uh, to call 311 for inspections. That way the city can come in and um, look at the apartment and open violations. That way um, uh, the violations are open online and uh, anyone can look up these violations um, on the HPD website. There um, are a couple ways to file an HP action for repairs. The first is to go in person to housing court, um, go to the clerk's office and ask the clerk to file an HP proceeding. And there's typically um, a clerk there that can walk you through all the steps. Um, or what's really easy these days is to go online um, to this website. It's called justfix.nyc. And you can uh, simply write your name, address, and the conditions in the apartment that need to be fixed. And it'll generate um, what's called a petition and a notice of petition. And that would start the case. Um, but uh, what's really important is service. Um, so that means that HPD, which is a city agency, and the landlord must receive notice. Um, and this is where a lot of tenants um, make the mistake and serve, you know, either HPD and not the landlord, the landlord and not HPD. So it's critical that the service is done properly and the directions are usually on the first page of um, the HP papers. Um, and the service must be done uh, by certified mail or by certified mail and regular mail. And uh, you'll receive a court date. Uh, these days, the court dates are um, done by phone or you know, virtual uh, proceedings. And the first thing the judge is going to ask is, do you have proof of service? And that's why it's important to um, have the certified mailing receipt uh, with the correct address of the landlord um, and HPD. And the correct address of the landlord um, can typically be found on the HPD website. And next, um, Caitlin will be talking about uh, non-payments and holdover proceedings. Yes, hello everyone. And thank you so much for having us. I'm going to very, very briefly explain the two different types of cases that landlords bring against tenants in housing court and the primary differences between them. The first type is non-payment proceedings. Uh, so these cases are about money. They're brought to collect rent that the tenant agreed to pay. Uh, so you should know that there are required notices that the tenant must get before the landlord can bring suit. Um, you have to be informed in writing two separate notices before suit can be brought. When a non-payment case is commenced, the tenant must be served with a petition which lays out the amount of back rent sought and when it accrued. Uh, so there will also be some other mandated information in the petition, things like whether the apartment is rent stabilized. 
So I, I want to say this part's very important. The tenant must answer the petition, not ignore the petition because if the tenant does not answer or appear, uh, the landlord can get what's called a default judgment. And that means that they can get what they asked for in the petition. You know, it might be money and or possession of the apartment based exclusively on the tenant's failure to answer and defend themselves in the lawsuit. Um, so not showing up is not a good option. Uh, there are a variety of defenses that can be raised in the answer and in the litigation. So there are payment based defenses such as that the rent sought has already been paid. Uh, the tenant could argue that they shouldn't be required to pay the full rent because of the bad conditions in the apartment. Another example is the tenant isn't responsible for the rent arrears because they receive a subsidy such as section eight that should have paid the rent that the landlord is now seeking. Um, another example would be overcharge. If the apartment is subject to rent regulation and the landlord has charged more than the permissible amount, um, the tenant can bring that up in the non-payment proceeding. Again, the, this isn't an, an exhaustive list. This is just you know, a few common examples. Um, next slide, please. So the secondary type of proceedings landlords would bring are holdovers. Um, now, these are not about the money. These are brought because the landlord wants to get the apartment back. And there are a few common scenarios where we see holdovers brought. This could happen after the lease term has ended. Um, as has been discussed, private market landlords at present don't have an obligation in general to offer tenants a renewal lease. So when the lease ends, they can try to regain the apartment even if the tenant hasn't done anything wrong. Another frequent example is a nuisance case. These arise when the landlord claims there's a recurring or continuing pattern of objectionable conduct from the tenant something that would threaten the comfort and safety of others in the building. Uh, the landlord can really bring a holdover case over any sort of breach of a substantial obligation of the tenancy, and they can bring these at any point in time. They can bring it whether there's a lease or not. They can bring it during the lease term. Um, it covers kind of a, a wide variety of situations. So you should know that a predicate notice may or may not be required depending on the circumstances in holdover proceedings. Um, most often a notice is required. Um, and that notice would at a bare minimum state the nature of the claim or why the landlord intends to bring a suit. So in any event, the tenant would still have the opportunity to defend themselves in court in holdover proceedings as well as non-payment proceedings. So that's really the gist of uh, the proceedings that landlords could bring against you as a tenant. So again, thank you so much for having NILAG speak, um, speak on these important topics tonight. Thank you so much. Um, we now have Kenting from Legal Aid and on what's happening with the courts the eviction moratorium and online cases. Hey everyone, um, is it possible for me to share the screen? Let's see if I can. You should have permissions to do so. If not, Brilliant. I will. Brilliant. All right. It's the first time I've done this before on Zoom, so let's hope this works well. Um, okay. All right. So, what is this moratorium? You guys have heard about it in the news. It's been all over the place. Well, formally, the moratorium is the COVID-19 Emergency Eviction and Foreclosure Prevention Act of 2020. It's a bit of a mouthful, so it's often abbreviated to the EEFPA, or rather EFFP. Um, what this means is that evictions are much harder to obtain. I wanna note here that this doesn't say evictions won't happen. Evictions can, happen, can still happen and have been happening, but they are harder. And that's important to note because this gives tenants the opportunity to stop evictions. If you're interested in the actual bills, here's the bills that uh, created it uh, in February 28, 2020. And then in May 4th, we had an extension of it. Now what this extension means is that the moratorium will now extend currently until August 31st, 2021. So that's important, remember that. Now does this moratorium mean that you just don't have to do anything and you'll be okay? Answer is no, you have to take care of things. 
in order to get the protections of the moratorium, you're gonna to need to file what's called a hardship declaration. Now this hardship declaration will make you protected and should generally prevent evictions from going forward. This effect, the hardship declarations apply to certain types of people. And what types of people are they? Well, if you suffer financial hardship, um, you will qualify under a hardship declaration or certain medical conditions. I don't wanna go through it all here because it's a lot and we're a little behind time, but I recommend that everyone who, really everyone, should check out the Hartford Declaration just to see if you are eligible. It's worth looking at. And you can find an English version here and a Spanish version here. I don't expect anyone to write these down right now. You can find them both from this URL. So this one you might wanna write down. You can also just Google New York Hartford Declaration. And at least for me, the English version is the first one, first result that pops up. Once you have a hardship declaration, you can send it in to the courts at this email, New York Hardship Declaration at nycourts.gov. Note that hardship declaration is singular, it's not declarations. So that's how you would you know, review it, fill it out, and then send it into that email in order to get the protections of a hardship declaration to prevent evictions from going forward. Once you filled it in, does that mean you're done? Still no, it's, it's still a process. Part of the issue here is that Laws are just words, right? They, they're just pieces of paper. And so what we need to do is understand them, understand the loopholes and understand where maybe they don't always protect us. One important example, pre-pandemic warrants. Now it's a bit complicated, um, but long story short, if you're in a non-payment case or in a holdover as well, you may at some point get a judgment against you and then a warrant. It is complicated and you may not always know whether there's a judgment and a warrant against you. So the point is some cases, especially those that are further along, may not be exempted from the moratorium. So if you get any notices from court saying that you have to appear, don't think that just because you've filed a, a, a more uh, hard declaration that you don't need to show up. You should always show up in court, even if it's just to say, I filed a hard declaration, I don't want this to go forward. In addition, and this is important, you should always respond to any documents that look like a marshal's notice. A marshal's notice is the final warning you get before people come to evict you. Now, maybe this was filed in error. Maybe the, the landlord is skirting the system. Maybe the court lost the hardship declaration. Either way, if you get a marshal's notice, you should need to go to court immediately, talk to them about it. There, you can easily deal with it, but you have to deal with it and you absolutely cannot ignore them. You'll have about two weeks and you'll notice it because it will say city marshal on the paper. So those are very serious. Should you have any of these cases, such as a case that has a pre-pandemic warrant or a case with a marshal notice or anything else, or if you just have a case that you filed a hardship declaration on, you're gonna wanna get legal services to help you on this. It's very important to have a lawyer when you go to court because this is complicated stuff. The, the courts themselves are still trying to suss a lot of this stuff out. So in order to do that, you really want to apply for legal services to see if you're eligible and you can get some help. And so uh, my colleagues from Lenox Hill are gonna talk on that next. Thank you. Thank you so much. You set it up perfectly. We now have Lenox Hill Neighborhood House who will be presenting on tools for tenants to connect with attorneys and general resources. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, we have slides, but I can get off and just kind of give a, a preview of who I am and who my colleague Arjuna is. So we're staff attorneys um, at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House in the legal advocacy department. We're a settlement house on the Upper East Side. Um, we provide free legal services to um, tenants around the city with housing benefits or healthcare issues. We do focus on the east side of, of, of the city, including East, uh, east Harlem and Roosevelt Island. Um, how you, so you can go to the next slide. How you um, get in touch with us is um, for housing issues specifically, you can leave a, voice, uh, a voicemail on our intake helpline. The number is 212-218-0503. And you can do that on Wednesdays from nine to five. If you have any other healthcare or benefit um, issues, call that hotline as well. And you can call throughout the week. Um, and also you can contact us and fill in an intake um, form at the link that's on the screen. So that's who we are. Um, hi everyone, I'm Archana, as Adela said, and i um, so glad to be here today. Uh, first resource we wanted to point to uh, is to submit the hardship declaration that Ken Singh 
uh, spoke about earlier, the website evictionfreeny.org is one of the easiest ways to submit your hardship declaration and gain protection under the moratorium if you're eligible. Uh, you can use this website to quickly complete your hardship declaration online. You don't need a printer. And then the website will actually then send the declaration for you to your landlord and to the court. So you don't need to mail it. The most important resource that we want to emphasize is calling 311. So when you call 311 Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., various things can happen. One, you can um, ask to be connected to the tenant helpline. And what that does is that there's an attorney or a, a paralegal and advocate on the line who can provide a free legal advice to you on the spot. And if it's something that the organization can take on as a case, they'll do a, an intake. If not, they can do a referral to an organization that can help you. The other thing that, one of the other things that can happen when you call 311 is that um, you can be referred to the landlord tenant mediation project, which is handled by the mayor's office. So what that mediation project does is helps tenants and landlords kind of get, um, come to agreements outside of housing courts as to unpaid rent, least concern to move out. For the mediation, both the landlord and the tenant has to be in, in, in agreement to, um, and you can get connected to that also through, um, through 311. Uh, if you've received court papers or if you have an upcoming court date uh, and you don't have an attorney already, you can also contact HRA's Office of Civil Justice to see if you're eligible for free legal representation in your court proceedings. Just call 718-557-1379 or you can email your contact information and the index number for your court case to civiljustice at hra.nyc.gov. The other resource that we also wanted to highlight is Housing Court Answers. So Housing Court Answers is a nonprofit that can uh, provide resources and detailed information about what's going on in housing court at the moment, housing law in general. If you have arrears and, you know, for some reason you, you don't qualify for ERAP or things that sort, um, if you call Housing Court Answers, they can connect you through to charities around the city that have a funding for arrears um, or whoever they're, they're able to identify. Um, where to refer you to, and you can contact them at 212-962-4795, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. through 5 p.m., and they also have a website. It's housingcourtanswers.org. Uh, another really helpful website is justfix.nyc. Uh, it's a pretty user-friendly online tool uh, that tenants can use firstly to generate a letter to their landlord demanding repairs, and if that doesn't work, to file a housing court case against their landlords for failure to repair or for harassment. Also, if you live in a rent stabilized apartment and you think your landlord may be overcharging you, you can also use Just Fix NYC to quickly request that your rent histories be mailed to you. Another resource that I, um, I wanna highlight today is the uh, Office of the New York State Attorney General Rent Security Deposit Mediation. So the Attorney General office um, offers uh, a mediation service to assist tenants um, that have issues with the landlord giving back their rent security deposits and interest. And again, with the mediation, both parties have to agree to go through the mediation process. So your landlord has to agree. So it's not the, the perfect forum to get your security deposit and you can um, contact them through the link here. And then two other resources really quickly that I want to highlight is the New York City Tenant Resource Portal. That is essentially like an online portal where you, you can, it's very easy to use on your phone as well. Um, at the link here, essentially um, what that portal looks like is you answer yes or no questions and it it's on all online and then it also it will give you the resources for you to um to to find an answer to your question and then also the mayor's office to protect tenants has a contact form um, which the link is there and they might be able to help you with more policy or any other issues that the mayor's office has connections to Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much to all our wonderful presenters. These topics are dense and complex and just thank you so much for taking the time to go through them. We now will go to questions. So we got some pre-submitted questions first um, and then we will go to live questions. We will try to get to as many as possible. If you don't get your question answered, our team will reach out to you um, and help you um, because some of the questions are uh, very individualized. So we will start and um, presenters feel free to jump in um, on any of the questions. Our first one is from a rent stabilized tenant. Um, I'm a rent stabilized tenant and my landlord receives low income housing tax credit. How do landlords calculate a tenant's monthly rent using LIHTC? Um, could I ask what the LIHTC stands for? I don't know the answer to that question. But. Yeah, it's low income housing tax credit. And I will just um, let me read actually one more rent stabilized question and we can take them in groups. Um, I'm a rent stabilized. I live in a rent stabilized apartment. My landlord hasn't given me a new lease in three years. Last time he did, he tried raising my rent retroactively and I wrote and said that's illegal. Please send a new lease beginning now and I will even waive the 90 day review. He never responded. So I'm just paying my old rent. Am I at risk? I think my answer would depend on whether you agree to like, I'm assuming there's some HUD certification um, thing there. So I, I can't really answer unless I know more information as to like, if you, when you certify, sometimes they'll have you sign paperwork to, and then I, I would want to know more information before I answer that question. We can definitely connect you um, to the person who asked the question so we can get them, get them mm -hmm. the help, the right help. Um, and then the one more on rent stabilization. My landlord says that his 421A is expiring and he will take the building out of rent stabilization. I have SCREE, will this impact me in any way? He also had 11 apartments on the on housing lottery um, where all apartments were rent stabilized. How can this, how can the building be part of, how can the building be rent stabilized and part of it not be rent stabilized? And again, <laughs> we can we can connect to the we can connect uh, presenters to the constituent um, to work more closely on the case if if people don't know right now. Um, yeah, just a little bit more information would be needed, and you know, I just want to you know, unfortunately, when we do these events, especially because when it comes to housing justice and housing rights, it's a, it's more, you know, requires a lot more information to give like a real meaningful answer. Um, but like for the landlord converting or talking about not renewing his 421A, sounds like he may be looking to go like making market rate and co-op. Um, if that's the case, um, this is a time to organize and organize tenants to fight against converting into co-op. Um, under the new re regulation laws that passed in 2019, there was a change around this, around the, the percentage that is required, the percentage of tenants that need to like, say no, they're against it. Um, and forgive me, because I can't remember, but I, I want to say it's like 30%. It might not be that, but it's you you need a certain percentage of folks um to say they don't want to opt out and again it's a lot more questions that come with it um but yeah just it will be a lot organizing is going to be required and if this is a building in manhattan and depending on where you are i would definitely reach out to take root justice manhattan um, met council on housing um or lennox hill or any of the 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 organizations that are part of here, if they're not in your in Manhattan, then we could also give you organizations that are working um, in your community to 
get more information because you know even though we are some of us are legal service providers believe it or not like the organizers know a lot and um they they come with so much information and so you don't always need a lawyer um a lot of the organizers are very informative thank you that is super helpful oh sorry please Sorry, just one thing I wanted to briefly just, just note as well. Um, one of the par parts of the question was, can a building be partially rent stabilized, partially not? And I, I just want to point out that uh, when it comes to rent stabilization, it's not a building wide thing. Um, so you certainly could have in any given place, some units that are rent stabilized, some units that are not. Note that rent stabilization also doesn't mean that all apartments will be the same rent. You could have a rent stabilized apartment where the rent is like Three thousand dollars, and next door, a rent stabilized apartment for a hundred. Well, not a hundred, but like a thousand dollars. And next to that, something that's market rate. So, rent stabilization is apartment specific. Just wanted to point that out. And also, um, with respect to the scree aspect of the question, I think there was a, a question about whether your scree would continue if the apartment was legally taken out of rent stabilization. And my understanding is that it would not. You would you would need to have a rent stabilized apartment to to get your scree benefit. Well, I, I, I mean, be, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it would be more information, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, as you said, you know, that there, there's many ways to, uh, a landlord will say it's no longer rent stabilized and actually it is. Uh, so definitely uh, connect with an attorney if your landlord is saying that and also uh, help organize in your building. But if, if it is truly uh, able to be taken out of rent stabilization in that specific case, uh, your scree benefit as I understand it wouldn't continue for that particular apartment. Right, and to answer that question, um, I think there needs to be a little bit more um, research on the status of the building. And one way you can do this is to uh, go on justfix.nyc and request a rent stabilization report. And that should be mailed to you um, maybe two weeks upon request to uh, your, your home address. Um, and also checking on ACRIS um, to see the, the filings, the Department of Finance has filings on the status of the building. Um, so to answer that question, I, I think it would require someone to do some digging, um, but those are a couple places to start. Thank you very much and sorry for uh, stepping away ever so briefly. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their presentations. We had a, a question about ERAP, uh, particularly Pandemic Eviction Protection Program. Uh, the specific question is how long, I, I think you shared information on how to apply, how long does it take for the protections to go into effect? So how I, if it's the hardship, you know, if you submitted your hardship declaration, um, I, uh, you know, I've worked with folks who've submitted it and the court has been really fast to respond and say, we've got it. And they've acknowledged they've got it. Um, it's in effect as, as far as the memorandum is in effect. And as far as I know, the hardship declaration is in effect from the moment you submit it. Um, and they acknowledge that they received it. And so you're protected as of now until August um, this year, I think August 31st um, of this year under that hardship. So your landlord, if you filled it out um, already and submitted it, your landlord should not be, you know, one sending you any eviction notices with marshals coming to your house because that hardship should, is in order. And if God forbid, um, you know, that happens, I would definitely recommend just having the, the declaration at hand. And, you know, if you do you know, and if that happens, reach out to our office or if you have a lawyer, contact your lawyer immediately. But because there have been some cases we've seen where some illegal lockouts. So there have been some evictions happening. I won't, I, I can't specifically say because even if they filled out the hardship agreement, but I know that there's, you know, illegal lockouts. So people getting illegally locked out and that takes time. But at least if you have some documentation to prove and if you have Ben Kalos's phone number on hand, then you can call him and be like, hey, I'm not suggesting that, but you know, since he, he works for you. You can call me anytime I do. I work for all of you. Uh, there's a question about uh, Sorry, before you continue, I just wanted to point out one thing about ERAP. 
Um, so the hardship declaration, if you submit and you're eligible under the moratorium, it will put your court proceedings on pause. With ERAP, if you apply for ERAP, what I understand is your court proceedings, eviction proceedings will be on pause until there's a determination made about your eligibility. And then if you're found to be eligible for those people, there's additional protections that kick in at that stage, um, which include you can't be evicted for not paying arrears that are covered by the ERAP payment, your landlord can't charge you late fees associated with those arrears covered by the ERAP payment. Uh, for one year after you get the first rent payment, your landlord can't increase your monthly rent above the amount it was in the date that you submitted your application. Um, and your landlord can't bring in eviction case or um, a holdover case against you for 12 months after you receive uh, that rental assistance payment. Uh, there's some small exceptions, but there's a bunch of protections that take place once you're approved for ERAP. Yeah, and if God forbid they don't honor those protections, then definitely reach out to the organizations like Lenox Hill and others because we all know from experience working against a lot of these, you know, unfortunately very bad landlords that these protections exist and they don't honor them. And so they think that tenants don't know their rights. And so just, you know, let them know you know your rights. And if they still violate them, reach out to the organizations. Terribly sorry. One other quick thing I just wanted to add about that. Um, you're asking when does it kick in? Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to kick in immediately. But note that, like I said earlier, you really want to email it. I have had cases where they were mailed in and the court would sk schedule a case anyhow. And they told me, yeah, we have like piles of mail that we haven't even opened yet. So email is better. And even then, just keep your eye out. Uh, court's a little bit under the gun right now. So, um, you know, just because you filed it doesn't mean that they're going to be doing it, even though they should. So keep an eye out and feel free to talk to Ben Kilos or any one of us. If I'm going to say maybe if you don't have the accessibility to email, see if your local elected officials can support you, because then you at least have that. You had an elected official send in. So if there's any like dispute, we'll be like, well, Ben Kalos' office and, you know, we have the proof. So. I would also recommend, I guess, if you can't email it, you could try to submit it in person. But, you know, that can be messy. Like you don't. It, it's, it's not entirely safe to go to court just because of COVID still. But um, yeah, definitely reach out to folks if you need help doing it and uh, let people know. Okay, I'm gonna keep going uh, with questions that were pre-submitted, but we got uh, three questions, uh, which are, can a host or participant please repeat phone numbers? Uh, folks asked specifically for Andrew Shapiro's number. Uh, we also had somebody uh, who had a question that is personal in nature and they just want to be able to reach out directly to the speakers. Uh, that was from an anonymous attendee. And then uh, just uh, from, from Suzanne Ventura, uh, they would love the speaker's contact info. So chat isn't enabled. So if folks can just go in the order that they spoke uh, as part of the uh, event and just share uh, whatever contact information they would like the entire world to have in perpetuity on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Sure. Um, so I'm an organizer. My name is Abby at Tenants and Neighbors. Um, and my contact info, my email is ang at tandn.org. And then my phone number is 929-359-3389. And I'm happy to repeat any of that again, if need be. Okay, I guess I'll give my information. Um, I'm Sandra I. Coleman once again. And if anyone wants to contact me, they can contact me at directly at activistsandriacoleman at gmail.com, um, A-C-T-I-V-I-S-T-S-A-U-N-D-R-E-A -E Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. Once again, activistsandria at gmail.com. I'm also on um, <clears throat> many social media platforms that you can actually directly um, DM me. Um, and yeah, that's it for me or the Combs Isaac Coalition as well. You can reach us there also. Pilar? Um, yeah, so Pilar De Jesus from Take Root Justice and my direct phone number is 
459-3031, but we also have a hotline and that is 929-506-3022. And then I know Andrea is not here, but I'll give you guys Met Council on Housing's hotline number. Their hotline number is 212-979-0611. And my email is P as in Pilar de Jesus, D-E-J-E-S-U-S at takerootjustice.org. Uh, Caitlin or Randy from NILAC? Um, my name is Randy Lee. I'm a senior staff attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group. And you can find my um, email address and phone number on the caption um, of my square. It's R as in the color red, L as in the animal lion, E as an elephant, E as an elephant, at nylag.org. And my work phone number is 212-613-7339. Caitlin? I'm hoping next time you spell it out, you use R for Robin so that you can stick with the animal theme. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> I spell my name out using animals too. Okay. Uh, Ken Singh from uh, Legal Aid. Sure, uh, I'm Ken Sing Ng. I'm a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society. And you can call or text me at 774-270-0596. That's 774-270-0596. You can also email me, which is probably the best way to get in touch with me, at KNG, that's Kilo November Golf, at legal-aid.org, dash like the minus sign. Did you ever serve in the military? I, I've not, no. Fair enough. I've, I usually hear military veterans use that. Uh, Lennox Hill? Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm a staff attorney at Lennox Hill, and email is probably the best way to reach me. That's A-G-E-O-R-G-E, -E, A-George, at Lennox, L-E-N-O-X, Hill, H-I-L-L, dot org. You can also call me directly on 732-737-7513. Great, thank you. Is there, I don't, I hope I didn't miss anybody. Uh, um, Caitlin? Yeah, yeah, I can uh, say mine as well, just so that Randy doesn't get all the calls and emails, um, but I added it as well as my title. So uh, it's kfilzer at nylag.org, K-F as in Frank, I-L-Z as in zebra, E-R, and then uh, you can call me, my direct line is 212-613-7571. And you can do text through that line as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Uh, there's a question uh, it says, please explain the tools homeowners can leverage as, and this is the quote from the person is this is a double ended sword that puts tenants against owners. Um, so I'm guessing that is a question about how ERAP works. And uh, there may be some good news for that landlord. Um, I, I can answer that question. Um, so uh, ERAP is um, a program that the landlords could also apply for on behalf of the tenant. Um, it just requires the landlord to um, gather the tenant's information. Some of the information includes whether um, the tenant has a social security number, the number of people in the household. Um, but most of this information the landlord um, may already have as part of the initial um, rental um, process. And so um, that process can be started on the um, OTDA website. If you just Google OTDA, um, it's usually the first thing that comes up. And the ERAP application um, is relatively simple. Um, it's online. Um, it does require homeowners to provide documents like the lease agreement, um, uh, a rent ledger, um, and all of that can be found um, online. The application is available. Um, and if anybody else has anything to add, um, I think that's the good news I can give homeowners. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I would just encourage homeowners and renters to just, I mean, we're only a couple of days in the state legislation session ending, but just supporting what many of us, I, I don't want to speak for all of us here, but I, I will speak for myself. We were calling for cancellation of rent and mortgages. You know, the rent relief program obviously does help with some relief, but at the end of the day, it's still, you know, is that going to cover the, what was it, Kalos, $1 billion? um debt and so yeah they got a lot of federal money and i i think that the federal money actually exceeds what's owed so uh, no evictions then this year we're not going to see no evictions no people from mouth to god's ears uh we have a erap question from suzanne ventura should we just include hardship declaration doc in with all the other attachments for the erap application I don't, I don't think you need to. Um, the the ERAP is sort of separate from the the uh, the harsh declaration. Harsh, the harsh declaration stops your case. Ironically, ERAP will do the same. So if you can't get in the ERAP, put in the harsh declaration. But I don't think ERAP needs your harsh declaration. The court should, though. So if you have one, send to the court. Don't extend to ERAP. And uh, along the same line, same person asking a similar question. If one had rent struggles this last year, and have not paid, we can't produce a receipt, nor can we get a referral to enable a move. Uh, so what, what should that person do? So, I'm not clear on the question. Is the Are they trying to get rent relief assistance for the arrears or for the move? Yeah. I think they, I think it's uh, for the arrears where they don't have a receipt. It's the third question on the Q&A. I remember seeing some of the questions earlier. And so I wonder if this person might be asking that they want to move. I know they were asking about getting a referral about previous rent paid. And I guess the issue is that what, you're, what they may be asking is, if you haven't paid rent for, say, the past year, and you're looking to move, and the new landlord is saying, can I get a letter saying that you are good on your rent? I mean, and, and someone else stopped me because I, I haven't really heard much about requesting referrals from old landlords. I don't know of any requirement that old landlord, that, that former landlords prevent pro provide a letter saying that you've been current on your rent. Um, especially if you if you have fallen behind, um, you're unlikely to get that letter. Um, and so in terms of getting a new apartment where they're requesting referral, that, that may be difficult. What you could do if you're still in the old apartment is try to use ERAP to get current, to pay off the arrears. Um, and then once you're current, you should get a, well, I mean, if you're, if you have a housing case, you should get a stipulation closing the case saying that you're current. And that should suffice for any other landlords who are interested or just get a rent bill. Um, one thing I was saying that technically landlords are supposed to send a receipt for every payment they get or miss. Even if they don't, they usually send out a rent bill saying, oh, you owe this much money. And if they say, have a letter saying that you're current, then you could use that for the next one saying that I have a letter saying that I'm current. But yeah, that would require you to, to get current. Okay. Um, so she, we've gotten multiple responses from Susan. She wants to move out. She New landlords want the referral letters. Uh, I think this is actually a response. I, I'll, I'll take this one. We made it illegal for people to use the... Uh, um, credit check. Uh, specifically, they used to check whether or not you've been in housing court. I have legislation in the council. The state ended up making it illegal. They're still using it. So you end up with landlords doing one of two things. Either they're still doing the credit check, which is against the law, or the new thing is they're asking for you to produce uh, rental history. Uh, I recently moved, and even before I was moving, people were asking me for five years of rental history. And I was just like, what are you people like smoking? Uh, and uh, forgive me, that probably was not the most professional way to say it, but I think it was the most accurate. The, the attorneys are telling me that's the term of art. Uh, and so it seems like we basically came together as a state and said, you can't use the fact that people have been to housing court or have had arrears or anything against them. And so they came up with something new. So I'll just say uh, to, to our folks on this call, and, and if anyone wants to hop on, I'm interested in introducing legislation that would ban landlords from circumventing all the other laws we've made by requesting proof of prior rental payments because that's um, that's baloney. I have a three-year-old and I'm learning not to curse as much. That's baloney. 
Uh, so thank you for bringing that up and it, it makes my blood boil. And I don't think it's helpful for, you know, the, like, that's just a lot, especially after a pandemic. And you're right, it's a new tool they're using. And I would be great to support a resolution that, you know, definitely stops that. I hadn't heard about that. And I'm really sad. And I think if that's also happening, that's another thing to organize. Like, this is, especially after a pandemic, I think, you know, having to prove if you've been able to keep up, you know, anyway. But yeah. Okay. Uh, let's just try to get through the questions because the, the questions keep coming in on the Q&A. Uh, this is a question about Section 8 vouchers. My understanding is that 15,000 Section 8 vouchers, housing choice vouchers, are now available. Who is, uh, who is eligible and how do you apply? Pilar. I was going to say, I felt like I talked a lot, but I definitely told Abby I would answer this. And so, yeah, it looks like, you know, New York City, if you fall into the bracket of what, you know, into their category, um, you could apply. But the thing was, is that there was a time um, from the way I understand it, it was between um, May 1st and May 28th. So it's now closed. But if you want to be accommodated, they do say you can get accommodated. And um, again, so you so let me just say what are the requirements. You have to be 18 and over um, and reside in an income eligible household. Um, and they tell you what the income eligibility, but just to give you a little breakdown of what that is, if you live in a one person family, it, the income limits were 41,800. 41, if you lived in a two person, it was 47 and the numbers go up. Um, I don't know, roughly maybe by like five to 10,000 for each per, um, family. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it was available from May 17th through May 28th. And it was available on the NYSHR's website in the section eight section. Um, and again, it seems like that, that time period has closed but if you'd like to request in a reasonable accommodation to submit your application or co co complete one if you have you don't have access to one and would like to fill one out or if you have some you need some language assistance they ask that you call this number um 833 -990 um, and they definitely highlight that the application does not guarantee placement on the wait list or receipt of the voucher for Section 8. So if you wanted to apply, it seems like, and this is what I have problems with because that doesn't give enough people time, but, you know, I understand that it's limited. Um, so it's been closed, but they are making accommodations. And I think that if you can get it in, you know, it's only June, what is today, the 4th, the 3rd? Um, you know, make that and then maybe get some support from your local elected officials to be like why you should be accommodated. Thank you. I, I feel a lot of work coming on, but it's my job and I love it. Uh, we have more questions on tenants' rights, repairs and violations, seniors, before we get to the Q&A. Uh, we have a question from a market rate tenant and senior citizen. Their annual income is above the poverty line and their landlord only offers one year lease. So each year they must negotiate their monthly rent and utility expenses. What are their rights as a tenant for the remainder of their current lease? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. Um, so unfortunately the fact that they are um, older isn't relevant unless they're in a rent regulated unit. Um, so just looking at a market rate apartment, um, your rent can't be increased during the lease term. So meaning if you have a lease that starts August 1st and ends July 31st and it's $1,000 a month, you don't have to pay any more than that through the end of July. But if your landlord wants to raise your rent and you're on a one-year lease, um, they can do that. They have to give you notice um, and the amount of notice they have to give you depends on how long you've been living there. Uh, but the notice period is between 30 to 90 days. Um, and they have to give you that notice if they either don't intend to renew your lease or if they intend to raise it, uh, to raise your rent by 5% or more. So those are um, 
the biggest protections you would have as a market rate tenant. I just wanted to raise one more thing um, as a market rate tenant, uh, which may be relevant. Depending on the circumstances of your move, you may be able to terminate your lease without penalty um, if your landlord um, you know, has locked you into an agreement that you're finding really hard to meet. Um, it applies really to senior tenants who are relocating to adult care facilities, nursing homes and particular forms of senior housing. So if you are in that position, connect with one of us and we can help you terminate the lease early. That's another right you may have. Uh, we have a questions about repairs and violations. Uh, what do I do if my landlord has not addressed violations in my home? I presently have a landlord with multiple buildings with violations, but can I use them because of said violations? What options can be provided after work has been done, violation fixed? So I guess first question is, uh, how can somebody get violations fixed? And then um, let's answer that question. And if anyone understood the second question, we will do your best to address that too. Um, I'd be happy to answer that question. Um, so if there are, um, violations that are still open, um, or if they've been fixed, um, but not satisfactory, if the you know, conditions have reoccurred, um, I would advise to first call 311 and have the city come in and do a reinspection. Um, and then, um, to start an HP case, because once the HP case starts, then um, a judge would be able to order the landlord to make repairs by a certain date. Um, the city would be involved. Um, and at that point, you know, I think it's really up to um, the city and the judge to get those, um, and the landlord to get those repairs made. Um, not sure if that answers the question. And I would also just add um, that, you know, on top of, you know, considering doing the HP action, you know, something that we're, we're strong advocates at Take Root Justice is in the power of organizing, which is, you know, why you should definitely reach out depending on what borough you in. And you can reach out to our hotline and find out, hey, I'm in Brooklyn, what community-based organization is working with tenants around harassment with landlords? And harassment is including a lot of these HP situations. Um, reach out to them because, yeah, you should you you should definitely follow HP if you want to move forward. But definitely, you know, in anything we recognize, even in the power of voting, um, we're stronger in numbers. And so, if tenants are organized and know their rights, right, and if you can get like six people, let's say, if there's in a building of ten, you know, the landlord's got to go against six and not just one. And you then be, you create power within you, and you also like remind folks. At least in my experience, even personally being um, targeted by my landlord, um, you know, it's just so much powerful when we're 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 fighting in a united way. And so, reaching out to the community-based organizations who are organizing tenants, building leadership, and um, helping them understand their rights before even filing an HP, because it is important to file an HP. But also that can hold up a lot of time in court and it's not fun. And it's not, in my experience, it's not been fun to be like, we're waiting, we're waiting. Like I got one building that was in a fire, a seven alarm fire on Thanksgiving, like a week before Thanksgiving in 2017. And the landlord still has not allowed the tenants to move back in even after two orders. So organizing and targeting him outside of the court is what's put, been putting the pressure on him lately. So on top of what um, Randy just mentioned, definitely reaching out to the community-based organizations. Um, I'd also like to add, you know, what some tenants do, and I typically don't recommend this, is um, they withhold rent. So that means they hold on to the rent and they don't spend it. Um, they put in their bank account or they keep it in a safe place and that really gets the landlord's attention because then the landlord um, may file a non-payment case against you but at that time you know the landlord's already paid to start a, a case against you one of the defenses that you can raise is um, conditions that the landlord didn't repair um, at that point the you know the judge or the parties might agree to make the repairs and make the payments by a certain time 
Um, the danger is, you know, once you have, you know, that money in the bank, like expenses come up and um, it's, uh, I always invite my clients to like pay the rent and also the rent abatements are typically very, very small. Um, so it's not even that much, um, but that is what some tenants do to get the landlord's attention. Yeah, I would just like highlight to Rani, I'm sorry, we're talking a lot, but like rent strikes and I hear everybody, they, yeah, they want to stop paying rent for sure. I'm with you. But I myself have known holding on to escrows are important. So working with the legal service providers, if you can get that, is also helpful. And also, again, being educated on what it even means to, to do a rent strike is important, which is where, again, the community-based organizations come in because that, be, that can become iffy, and, um, again. But I know in our case, we've definitely have done escrow for folks. But yeah, that's, a, that's like um, not the first solution that I we always suggest. So... Yeah, the, yeah. So yeah, Randy, thank you because yeah, I mean it's just so dangerous because once the landlord does make the repairs, you're going to have to pay the rent, and if you don't have it, you're putting yourself in danger of an eviction. So I would tread very carefully with. Uh, always, if you're going to do it or it's something you're considering, work with one of the folks you're hearing with today. Make sure you're setting the money aside so that if you win in court and you get abatements, that's found money that you're getting back, and if not, but. Uh, Make sure before you start withholding rent that you speak to one of the professionals on our call and call my office because we can connect you. Uh, we have uh, two more questions on seniors before we get back to the Q&As that are coming in over Zoom and then we will end on time at eight o'clock. Seniors and people with disabilities, what accommodation should one expect regarding grab bars in the bathroom, safe tile and light color replacement for seniors with the eyesight issues? and what portion of dollars should rental tenants expect to pay themselves? Who could intercede on behalf of senior disabled tenants? Someone in the company management team, please address fear of reprisal for the tenant. Um, I can start with this one. Uh, so my understanding of uh, landlords obligations to provide reasonable accommodations is that Unfortunately, it looks like the law doesn't see age per se as a means to provide a reasonable accommodation. So senior status in itself may not be sufficient, but what I would suggest you do is um, in your request for a reasonable accommodation, set out you know, your circumstances, including your age, of course, and mobility issues or whatever it is, and um, ask for that reasonable accommodation, such as grab bars in your building. Um, and you know, I think courts, the case law is complicated on uh, what uh, a landlord is obligated to do by way of a reasonable accommodation, but the best place to start really is to put that in writing and put as much personal detail about your circumstances as possible, along with potentially a doctor's note if relevant. Uh, it might also just be worth connecting for the person who asked that question, connecting with Lenox Hill because they do have senior services and there's weird medical equipment that you can get if you're on Medicaid and uh, touch base with Lenox Hill. Um, they may be able to work with a Medicaid provider to get you a grab bar. I, it's fuzzy, but I did a quick search and I think that Medicaid will cover home modifications to add grab bars throughout so that you can be safe. Uh, What's the landlord's responsibility about keeping seniors safe from dogs on leashes or off leashes and children on tricycles in communal areas jeopardizing senior safety? Fall specifically, how can house rules and safety be enforced? That might be a very tough question. Yeah, I think that also comes down to what it says in the lease around pets. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on this one, which is just one of the things we spend a lot of our time doing in our office is working with neighbors and getting neighbors to get along together. Uh, so if you are in a situation where there's been a breakdown of courtesy between you and neighbors, uh, if folks are leaving um, children's equipment, 
uh, try to see if we can work together to find a safe space for the equipment to be. If there's no way to do it, if the hall is just too narrow, happy to try to work with you and the management or even just you and your neighbor and try to facilitate. We, we do it probably more than we probably should. Uh, in New York City, we're all living on top of each other. So our office can try to help mediate where we can. Uh, we've got uh, seven more questions on the Q&A. I'm gonna cap it here. Um, three of the questions are coming from somebody. We're gonna have my staff write down your contact number and uh, we will work with you to uh, pick one of these great attorneys here to see about referring your case out. Uh, the attorneys wanna look at the Q&A doc. This relates to a person seeking a uh, transfer within RY management. And so if anyone's interested in the case, let us know. Otherwise we will work with them to get a better understanding. It sounds like they are in touch with my staff. Uh, so we will try to do our best to help and make sure we have this information. And uh, we're actually right near where they live. Uh, one of the good things. Uh, uh, we have a question about, even though the housing voucher program is over, uh, if you could please repeat the number for the housing voucher program. And so the number is 833-990-4001. And again, they definitely have a disclaimer that it does not guarantee a placement on the waiting list or receipt of a housing voucher. Okay, we've got two last questions. It looks like one of them is getting answered by somebody typing an answer, so we'll go to the other one. Uh, so this is from Kimberly Wadsworth. Uh, thanks, would this protect me from a, I'm guessing this is e ERAP, would ERAP protect me from potential massive rent increase on my apartment? My building was recently bought by a new owner and we've just informed all of us that he is not renewing our current leases, but is more than happy to start over again with new lease with him at current market value, which is much higher rate. And I wouldn't be able to afford, nor can anyone in my building. He hasn't said anything about capital improvements or any other benefits. Yeah, I, I, I around seven ten. I mean, there's a lot of questions there. When you say that there's a massive rent increase, do you live in a rent stabilized apartment? Because if you live in a rent stabilized apartment, landlords cannot initiate rent massive increases. They are obligated to um, follow the rent guidelines board um, determination, the board that I mentioned earlier. So if you're in a rent stabilized apartment, he has to honor the rent stabilization, rent guidelines board determination. And those those rents are covered from September. In the Q&A, it is saying it's a market rate apartment. Okay, so th that's a little different and um, you're not as protected when it comes to rent increases as you are with rent stabilization. Um, but I also just wanna highlight though, for the other question I know was answered, for all tenants that are listening, just so you know, the law requires that you have habitable conditions. Now, I know some people think, oh, my tiles is this color from that tile, that color of that tile. The law doesn't really say that, but like there are violations. And that's why 311 is important calling it because it's a record keeping. So like no gas, you know, water problems, heat problems. Those are all things that you have the right, regardless if you have a lease or not. I mean, you know, if your landlord's not renewing your lease, your right as a tenant is to have conditions where you can live in. And, you know, unfortunately, that's why I appreciate the women here from NYCHA challenging the federal government because I don't see how the federal government doesn't see what they're doing is really harmful for tenants. But anyway, um, yeah, sorry, person with massive increases. I will also add just with ERAP, even if you're market rate, if your landlord accepts, if you're eligible for ERAP, so you apply tomorrow and your landlord accepts the funds, then for one year after that first ERAP rental assistance is received by your landlord, your landlord cannot increase your monthly rent payment above how much it is on the date you submitted your ERAP application. So uh, that could be relevant as well. And you know, if you're on a good rent amount now and you wanna lock that in, it could be helpful to submit your ERAP application as soon as possible. And I think somebody may have answered it by typing, but if somebody is just about to fall behind. They otherwise qualify for ERAP, but they know that starting in a month, they, they aren't gonna be able to cover it. Do they apply for ERAP 
now or do they wait till they have arrears? I think I answered this um, a little bit on the um, on the chat, but essentially I don't think you can apply for EUA preemptively. I do think that at the time of application, um, if you have if you're on unemployment benefits or you're experiencing any like financial hardship um, because of the pandemic, if you can demonstrate that you that you would be at a risk of homelessness or like housing instability, if your household income is at eighty um, is at or below eighty percent of AMI. And you're paying more than thirty percent of your of your income towards your rent at the time of application. I would I would encourage people to apply. I think it will take a, a, a bit of advocacy, and I, I think I don't think you'll qualify for the twelve months, but I think you might qualify for like three months of um, upcoming rent. So I, I think uh, up until you hit those requirements at the time of application, you can't really apply. But once you you hit all those, I would encourage um, folks to apply. Thank you very much to everyone who participated. I think we hit a high water mark on the Zoom of about 50 or so and 30 on the uh, Facebook for a total of about 80. Uh, I'm not seeing questions that came in over Facebook, uh, so it's okay for us to end a little bit early. I want to thank my staff who's been on this, uh, specifically Abby Damsky, who, who hopped in and filled in for me, our co-sponsors, uh, Congressmember Carol Maloney, uh, Giovanni Williams, who did join us, our Borough President Gail Brewer, Senator Liz Krueger, Assemblymember Dan Court, C. Wright, as well as Councilmember Keith Powers. I want to thank all of our amazing presenters from Homes Isaacs Coalition, Tenants and Neighbors, Take Root Justice, Met Council, NILAG, Legal Aid, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, uh, we've been doing this for years, and I can't wait to take this, uh, keep, keep going. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, been Can in town all my life, and we're going to keep fighting for you because your story, what all of you are going through, I've gone through too, and we can fix it. And we'll give the last word to Pilar. I just wanted to say thank you, Ben, and you know, good luck on your campaign. This is definitely not an endorsement for Take Root. This is my personal, you know, um, you know, wishing you well endeavors because you have been very supportive, personal and um, professional in this community. I, I, for folks who don't know, I kind of live on the cusp of Kalos's district, and so he's been a great um, elected official. And even though he's not my council person, he's been at my community boards many, many years and always supported in the house, the Rent Justice Coalition and the RGB and always roll back is what we've been fighting for. And so having these forums have been great. And so thank you. And I'm feeling a little sad because this is the last time you'll be as the council person hosting this. Hopefully, you know, moving forward as a public advocate um you know of manhattan here and so wish you best endeavors and i just wanted to say that thank you uh on, on and he didn't note, pay me to say that guys i'm telling you promise <laughs> we're, uh, i want to thank all the part all, all of our presenters and uh on that note have a great evening and uh if you didn't get your questions answers feel free to email us bkalos at benkalos.com 212-860-1950 and as we do every single first Friday of the month, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., I'll see anyone who wants to drop by and meet me in person over Zoom. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye, all. Good night.